All right, we're going to get started. Thanks, everyone, for coming. This is our first uh, Tech Jam session. And uh, it's a pleasure to have BG over here. Uh, BG has been programming in uh, functional languages since 2007, uh, when he first programmed for ClearTrip. Uh, he obviously has a lot of experience of uh, working in different functional languages, at least two that I can know of, maybe more. Uh, and we thought it would be a good uh, start of the Tech Jam to kind of look at you know, a different way of doing things. So that's when BG agreed to come in and do this talk. Also, uh, I would like to thank Ideas for hosting this. This is our first thing, and we'll probably do a lot more of these. So thanks again, and I'll hand it over to BG. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Harish. Am I audible? Or should I increase the volume a little bit? Is it OK? Can everyone hear me? No? What about now? What? Is it OK now? OK. Cool. Uh, thanks, Naresh. Uh, pleasure being here at the first uh, Tech Jam. My name is BG, and uh, I program in many programming languages, uh, but mostly functional these days. Uh, so this is kind of like going to be a less technical talk. I mean, I'm not going to talk too much about the theory of functional programming or lambda calculus or even a very sp any specific language in particular. I'll be showing you some examples uh, in some mainstream languages or some made up languages just to uh, explain the point. But for you guys, I want you guys to go home uh, with kind of like uh, some new ideas in your mind and uh, enough inspiration to check out uh, these things on your own. Because to be honest, an hour or even a day is not enough to teach or even uh, show you the beauty of functional programming. So let's get started. So the title of the talk is Why Functional Programming Matters. But more than that, it's why functional programming matters today. Okay? Uh, functional programming predates uh, Java, or it predates your mainstream programming languages by decades. Uh, Lisp was invented in the late 50s, early 60s. and uh, Lambda calculus predates list even by 10 more years. So it's nothing new, but so far we have been able to kind of cheat in many ways and get away. Uh, but now these problems, there are many problems which are now cropping up, and I think it's time we looked at alternatives. So before we start, a very quick poll. Uh, which programming languages do you use at work? Uh, what about Java? How many people use Java here? Majority, great. <laughs> what about Ruby? Any, any Ruby still? Okay, one. Uh, Python, or, or okay, few Python guys. Uh, JavaScript, I'm sure many people use JavaScript. Does anyone here use any functional programming language? <laughs> that guy, okay, and you too. Like you use Kala, right? Okay, and he uses Clojure. I'm another one who uses Clojure. Uh, cool, so we do not have many people here who have any uh, exposure to FP. I think then, then you know the talk is just perfect, uh, perfectly suited for you guys. OK. Up a little bit about me. Uh, I started uh, my career hacking Lisp at uh, ClearTrip in 2009. Uh, I personally care a lot about writing code that's correct and runs fast. Okay. Speed and correctness are two very important things for me. and. Uh, these are two kind of like driving uh, factors for me to, to choose any tool or any programming language. Uh, I'm a career polyglot programmer. I, I, I think I've learned maybe 25 to 30 different programming languages. Uh, today, I think I can still program in a, maybe a dozen. But uh, my focus has been in FP uh, due to a variety of reasons, some of which I will touch upon today. Uh, but I have dabbled in, in all kinds of languages. And uh, you know I'm kind of like consider myself a programming language theory enthusiast. Uh, currently, I'm CTO and co-founder at HelpShift. Uh, we are a enterprise mobile SaaS company. OK, okay so before we start, a uh, little bit of maybe a history to set the stage uh, to kind of like get some context before we move on and start talking about FP. Does anyone know this guy? <laughs> OK. Uh, 
this guy is John von Neumann, uh, a mathematician, uh, you know, a genius basically of his time. Uh, he is the guy who came up with this computational model that we use even today. Okay, uh, he came up came up with this concept of a stored program. Uh, it will, there will be a program; it will be stored. And uh, my main programming style would be by modifying some state somewhere. Okay, so there is some state. You can think of it as a variable, uh, it's a memory cell or whatever, a register maybe. So there will be some data kept in that register, and my program will basically continuously change the value that is stored in that register. Okay, and ultimately, once the program has exited, the final value will be stored in that register. And I can just you know look up that register to get back the return value. Sounds very obvious and common, right? It's nothing new. Uh, yes, uh, that is because it is the pervasive computation model that we use today. All mainstream languages, especially the imperative ones, are based on this model. Okay. For example, if I ask you to write a function to calculate, let's say, Fibonacci uh, and the nth Fibonacci number, so you'll start with something like a is equal to 0, b is equal to 1, and then in a loop you'll continuously change a and b, and ultimately the value is in b. Right. So again, that's, a, that's the von Neumann model. And uh, so programming languages starting with assembly languages, then C or other, other languages, they very closely model that machine model, OK? Uh, they very closely model it. It has certain advantages, uh, like you get very fast execution. If you are closer to the hardware, you, your code will run very fast. But I think uh, it also has disadvantages, uh, for example, your code is, uh, you know, huge, and you have to express some very uh, high-level kind of concepts using a language which is very low-level. Then you will end up writing a lot of code just to build those abstractions. Okay, and ultimately, when you have those abstractions in place, uh, it's still not very beneficial because those abstractions will leak one day. So, for example, you might have a very nice kind of API uh, which uh, runs on, let's say, C. So one day that abstraction will leak when uh, malloc is unable to allocate some memory for it. Okay. So this is called a leaky abstraction. And it will immediately be apparent that, OK, it seems the memory management is automatic here, but it's actually not. Ultimately, I am uh, calling malloc somewhere and it's failing. Okay. Or it could be due to some other reasons, like someone went and changed some part of the memory and your code just crashed. So we'll talk about these problems more uh, further as we move along. So von Neumann's core ideas, right? Uh, so the stored program model, uh, computation through mutation of memory cells. Okay, that's how I write my code. I'll have some uh, place in memory. I'll continuously change it. Another assumption: it assumes a single thread of execution. There is no notion of concurrency or parallelism in von Neumann's model. Okay. So think about it. Then how do we write parallel code or concurrent code today then? Right. How do we do that? Well, we have certain abstractions which distort reality, right? So for example, we have threads. Uh, even though my CPU probably has only one core, I can have many threads. Right? It gives me this idea that, OK, these things are working in parallel probably. But maybe they are not, right? Or I could have a variable, and uh, many threads could be accessing and writing to that variable at the same time. It's possible, uh, but it seems that they are doing it at the same time. But ultimately, they are not. My code execution—it's they are being interleaved, right? So if one function has five instructions, if another function has ten more instructions, the instructions could be interleaved. So these are the various kind of like implementation details that we often overlook, and that creates a lot of problems for us uh, along the road. For example, uh, I can have memory corruption, I can have deadlocks, I can have live locks, even worse, right? Uh, so yeah, so these are the core ideas that von Neumann's uh, computing model is built on top of, but 
these are there are other problems like single thread of execution right today we have uh, many cpus so we can't assume such a execution model uh, does anyone know this guy okay so this guy is called his name is gordon moore he uh, was the co-founder of intel and this guy gave us a gift many years back it is this gift i don't know if this is visible uh, this is called moore's law okay so according to god moore so this scale is logarithmic uh, every year the speed the number of transistors in a cpu will double okay and it has been happening since 2011 okay so cpu num our cpus have become more and more powerful every year they have basically become double powerful every year right? so it has grown at the exponential rate that also has kind of like given us this kind of cheat code which has allowed us to chug along so far uh, with a programming model which is built on top of von Neumann's ideas because i am switching context so fast that it seems that okay things are happening in parallel but they are actually not happening in parallel and when i'm writing my code i can still assume a single thread of execution and write my code just you know flat like that and it will still probably work uh, you know reasonably well i'll get my speed ups if i increase the number of cpus i'll probably get the speed ups so the honeymoon period you know went on till 2011 and then reality struck two different realities one is this newton's laws of physics okay uh the amount of the cpus started having so many transistors inside them and the die size was kind of like fixed we are not increasing the size of cpus right they were getting smaller and we were packing more and more transistors into the same kind of like die and ultimately what happened was that the amount of heat being produced between the connections in the cpu became so much that you know the cpu would just continuously burn if you uh, run it at that kind of speed okay that was a serious problem so one core of a cpu could not have more transistors than you know what was possible in 2011 so gordon moore's law basically kind of like it just ended right there we couldn't scale further that's one reality that struck us another is this not sure if it's visible it's called amdahl's law okay so amdahl came up with this law he said that so these are number of processors okay so 1 2 4 2 6 5 k and this is amount of speed up that i can get okay so 2x to 20x amdahl's law basically uh, theorized or kind of told us that the the, the the amount of speed up that i can get from my from my code is directly proportional to the amount of code that is parallelized parallelizable sorry <laughs> so if i cannot parallelize uh, let's say uh, 50% of my code then it doesn't matter if 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 let's say i have a million line code base and half a million is parallel okay so you can see the chart here this is 50% parallel parallelized right you will see that after i reach 16 cores i will stop getting any kind of speed up okay if i add hundreds of cores my code is not going to be any faster because this is amdahl's law at work here right so if i get to up to 75% not a lot you see that this is kind of logarithmic kind of growth right if 100% or 95% of my code is parallelizable then i can go up to 2000 cores what does it mean it means that if i want to utilize all the cpu all of my code will have to be parallelized otherwise i just cannot reap the benefits of having uh, multiple cores right so because this is how we kind of beat gordon's moore's law or the laws of physics that's how we did it we packed in multiple uh, cores in a single die right so today this laptop has eight cores so <laughs> if i'm writing code 
and uh, my code is only 50% parallel, I cannot get much speed up. So that's a problem. Okay. Uh, so we don't have much option, options really. Uh, all these traditional kind of programming models, they work fine till now. I think now is the time for us to kind of look at different alternatives. Okay. So that's where FP comes into the picture. So let me give you guys a kind of like a primer for what FP really is, right? Because there are many programming languages which claim to be functional, or there are libraries which will allow you to write code in a functional way. Uh, Scala, is it functional or is it object oriented? How are they even related? I hope to answer these questions today. So, a little bit of history. Again, uh, functional programming is based on a compute, another computation model, it's kind of like parallel to von Neumann's model. It's called lambda calculus. Okay. Lambda calculus was invented by this guy, Alonzo Church, uh, back in the very, very, uh, I mean, at least 60 years back. He was a logician. And his main job was to basically think about mathematical logic and figure out, you know, how to express computation as a logical kind of construct. How do you do that? So he came up with this, these concepts. So the core ideas, okay, the core ideas of FP are basically these. So computation, instead of having a stored program program model, instead of modifying memory cells. Computation is based on evaluation of lambda expressions. What does it mean? Well, uh, lambda expression is just a function. We all know about functions. We have functions in uh, all our languages in some way or the other, right? So you have functions and you just evaluate functions. That's the only thing. There is no variable. So since you don't have variable, things are immutable. Okay? So you will see that there are certain constraints, and those constraints give rise to a entirely different class of solutions for any problem. So, since my main focus is on just lambda, so lambda is basically the function. Uh, lambda calculus doesn't even have numbers; it doesn't need numbers. Uh, it, it's easy to show how you can emulate numbers or even basic things that we take for granted uh, using just the lambda. Okay, that's why the lambda abstraction is known as the lambda the ultimate abstraction because that's all you need to express any idea. So yeah, immutability is another very important concept in functional programming. Okay, if someone is selling you functional programming without immutability, do not buy. Okay, because there are certain guarantees on which uh, the correctness or or you know, some properties of functional programming rely on. If you don't have immutability, you can't re get those benefits. Okay, so it doesn't just doesn't make sense to have a functional language or a functional system where my data or uh, variables are actually variable; they are mutable. Uh, another core idea is, as I said, uh, function is the core abstraction, right? So it it's a, it is a first class thing. What do I mean by first class? Can anyone here explain what a first class function means? <laughs> anyone? What's a first class function? Sure. Sure. Mm. Excellent. Absolute. Absolute. Just think about any other thing in your language, like a number, right? Or a string. A function can take a string, it can return a string, you can manipulate the string as a value, right? So that's what a first class object or a first class thing is, right? So in functional languages, a function is first class. So let me give an example of a language where a function is not first class. Can someone give me an example of a language where a function is not first class? Huh? Java, right? Uh, be why? Because you have uh, the closest thing that you have to a function in Java is a method. Can you return a method from a, another method? 
can you accept a method? In Java, the first class thing is the object. That's the only thing which is first class. Even a class is not first class. You can't return a class. You have to instantiate that class and then return. Right. So, yeah, and then we have higher order function, right? So again, what is a higher order function? A higher order function is a function which accepts or returns another function. That's why it's higher order. It operates on the function abstraction itself, right? Instead of something which is lying uh, below it. And then, uh, so as I said, so you have this constraint, right? You cannot mutate things. You cannot change variables. Variables don't really vary in functional languages. So then you rely on a totally different way of solving problems. So one of them is uh, sequence transformations instead of mutation of memory cells. What I really mean by that is that to give you a very quick example which you might understand is that instead of a loop, I'll use recursion. Okay. So try to understand the difference. What's really happening when I uh, use a loop, right? I have to mutate some variable. I have some variable initialized somewhere outside the loop and in the body of the loop, I, I'm changing it. And then when I exit the loop, I return that value of that variable, right? Exactly, precisely the von Neumann model. But uh, in functional language, I cannot do that. I do not have that luxury. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's not really luxury, but uh, I don't have that facility of changing variables. So then I have to rely on recursion, where basically I, uh, the intermediate state is carried into the new function through its parameters. I pass the intermediate state along instead of changing some variable. So it's kind of like you can think of it as a chain of function calls instead of one function changing some variable all the time, right? I'll give you some example. That also leads to something called referential transparency. Uh, what's, what's a referentially transparent function? So one thing I forgot to mention is that Alonzo Church was a mathematician, okay? And one of the goals of FP, kind of implicit goals of FP was to derive this computational model which is based on mathematics. Okay. So in mathematics, when you say x is equal to 5, you do not again say x is equal to 10. I mean, your equation basically will not work if you changing, keep changing the value of x, right? Uh, it just doesn't work like that. Because in mathematics, once something has, given, has been given a value, that thing is constant or permanent for that kind of uh, program or the formula. I don't keep on changing. Five suddenly doesn't become six. But in uh, imperative languages, that is common. You can go and modify the plus function in Ruby, for example, and it will start doing math subtraction. Right? It's, it's possible. Uh, so referentially transparent function is basically a mathematical function. Think about the square root function as a function that you wrote in your code, right? So if I give it 16, the answer will always be 4, right? Always. It doesn't matter which day of the year it is or what other, uh, you know, conditions are in place. It doesn't matter because that function is pure. It only relies on the arguments and nothing else. It doesn't perform any side effects. It doesn't uh, perform any network I.O. It doesn't check email. Nothing, right? Now, it doesn't depend on anything else, just arguments. So then if that's true, then I can make some assumption. If the square root function is always dependent on its argument and nothing else, then maybe once I have calculated it, I can, you know, store it. I can cache it. I can replace that function call with the value directly right? instead of having that function. So for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, okay, next step, I'll give you an example. So give you an example of uh, immutability, right? This is a made up language. This is not any real language. Uh, might look like some real language. It's not. So what am I really doing here? So I have an array here. Is it visible? I'll just anyway read it out. So I have an array. X is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Then I print that X, and it shows me 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? So I know X is the array, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then I say Y is equal to x dot append 5. And then I print y of 
course, it's x with 5 added to it. But I print x again, x is unchanged. This is a very silly example, but just wanted to, you know, give you an idea of what immutability really means, right? It means that x, once it has a certain value, it cannot be changed. Whatever modification you try to do there, it will always return a new version of x, right? So y is actually a new version of x. X itself is unchanged. Yeah, many advantages, but mainly because maths, right? In mathematics, we don't have such stuff. But advantage, many advantages. Uh, if you don't have mutation, I don't have to worry about a whole class of problem. For example, if an array is given to me as an argument in a function, when I'm using it, can I rely on the value to be intact? Let's say I'm processing it, and I've been given this array, okay, by someone else. While I'm processing it, can I rely on it to be completely unchanged? So what do I do? I copy it, right? And that has huge performance repercussion. What if that that's a list with a million items in it? So I'm going to copy it, right? I'm going to copy a million items. So imagine the number of million items will be allocated, right? The garbage collector will run crazy if you have a GC based language or otherwise you will allocate real memory, right. So there are many other things. So let us say what happens if I assume it to be correct and go ahead. My code is full of bugs which no amount of TDD will uh, uncover, right. Because someone can change it and take my word for it, it has happened. Sorry. Oops, sorry. It has happened with me, okay. So walk down the memory lane. Uh, I was a rookie programmer at uh, ClearTrip and I, we used to use Lisp and Lisp even though it is a function language, it is not purely function. Okay? You can modify things. It is not, Im things are not immutable, things are totally mutable there. So I wrote some code and pushed it out at 6 a.m. in the morning. It was supposed to be some sort of a discount uh, which would give people some discount depending on some rules and I added that code. And I went back to sleep. And then at around 9 a.m., I got a call from the business team saying that, dude, what's wrong? I mean, I said, what's wrong? I don't know. You tell me. Uh, he said, we are selling tickets uh, for free. Said, what? <laughs> Let me check the website. And I checked it. It was not even free. The price shown was negative. Okay? But the payment gateway was rounding it off to zero and uh, selling it for free. We sold 800 tickets in three hours for free. We lost 10 lakh rupees. To be honest, in retrospect, that was the you know turning point for my uh, kind of understanding of programming. Okay, so I looked, I went back, so I immediately reverted that code and immediately left home for office. I got to office and uh, looked at my code. It was perfect. It was pure. So I I was given some a list of objects and I was mutating that list of objects. What's wrong with it? So what happened was that the objects that were given to me, they were all duplicates. They were the same objects repeated five times or three times in that array. Okay. So when I was mutating one object in a loop, I actually ended up mutating it in a quadratic manner. So if it has three items, I would mutate it nine times, the same thing. Okay. So I was adding the discount. And but I ended up adding the discount nine times, let's say, in, instead of just three times. So the discount became more than the ticket price, and it was negative, and that's what happened. And I didn't even write that code, right? My code was just this much, but the duplicate objects were coming from somewhere else. I had no idea. That made me think a lot, right? I take pride in myself in being a good programmer, and I could not accept something like this where I'm leaving a lot of my code's correctness to someone else who I don't even know, right? Or, you know, I don't know when that code is being written or it can change some other time. Who knows? The fix was simple. I had to copy those objects, right? And I'm sure you guys do that all the time, deep copy of some object. But that's very inefficient. And when do you put those things in? You don't know. Should you always copy? 
So right now, if you are dealing with mutable objects and you are not copying always, mark my words, huge vector for bugs. Someone can modify it. Like date objects, we all deal with Java date, right? So uh, what date library do you guys use in Java? Do you use Java util date? Yeah, everyone? Don't use it. Java util dates are mutable. Okay? So imagine this. This is so nonsense. That is stupid, right? Imagine having a date which is mutable. When I have when a new day comes, I do not go back and modify that date. It's a new date. When in when tomorrow when it will be 16th, I won't modify today's date in the calendar and put 16 in there, right? It's a new block in the calendar. Java util date is mutable. I think they are now changing it in 8 Java 8 or I think 9. They will probably make it immutable, which is good news. But you guys are stuck with Java 6 and uh, 7 for now, right? Don't use it. Use Joda time. Because Jora time, that date library is an excellent date library. Uh, and anyway, Java util date has other problems. It's a talk for another day. But you know, you have to use calendar and SQL timestamp and so many other things to just you know have simple date operation. So Jora date time library is a very good library. It's designed to solve these problems and it's immutable. Use it. Anyway, so to answer Naresh's question, so you know, I hope I answered your question uh, satisfactorily. But there are many other problems with Mutable stuff. It's not even concurrent. I mean, uh, you know, I've been given some value. I'm relying it to be a value. And while I'm using it, it's not concurrent. It can be some other thread, right? It need not be concurrent. Concurrent is different from parallel, right? And I mean, it's just that, yeah, you are right that it's a shared thing. Uh, and someone could change it. Let's say I'm holding on to it. It's a global variable. It's someone can change it from wherever, right? How do I put guards in place? Locking will not help here. Locking will only uh, help with concurrent access. But things will still change. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest things. Point is, you can't reason about your code. Okay. So let's grow up here. We have been programming for a while, all of us here. We still can't reason about it. Our goal should be to able to reason about the code. When I look at my code, I should be able to say whether it's going to work correctly or not. Today, if you're dealing with mutable objects, you cannot give that guarantee. You look at your code, your code will look uh, just fine. But someone else is changing the data from somewhere else, and you have no clue. So that's the goal. That's why we're talking about FP today. Because we want to take this craft of programming ahead, right, forward. <laughs> I want to be. I want to have more confidence about my code. I mean, back in the day, people used to think that test cases will give you more confidence. No, that's not true. Test cases will give you some kind of confidence, but that's not, you know, the full fledged, the hundred percent confidence. I mean, no, no tester can ever guarantee that all test cases have been covered, <laughs> especially when these things are totally kind of unknown, right? You you build uh, on a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Moving on. First class function, right? Uh, this is an example to see what's happening here. Okay, this, this is kind of like Python-like language. I think this is valid Python. I just typed it out. So, see what's happening. Okay, so I'm defining a function here called make adder. It's a classic example. It takes x. It's a number, and it returns a lambda. A lambda is basically a function. Okay. It returns a function right away. See what this function is doing? Something really curious. Okay? So you will see that this lambda basically is holding onto this x here. And this lambda now takes one argument, y. It's holding onto that, that x and just adds this y and returns the value. Okay? How do I use it? So I call make adder with 5. What will I get really? Look at this code. If I call make adder with 5, so it's 5 here. So I'm going to create this lambda expression, which takes one argument y and 5 here. Add 5. It basically adds 5 to whatever is passed to it, right? So here I'm saying add 5. 
is equal to make adder of phi. So this function returned a new function and I stored it in a variable. And then I just call it like a normal function. And it gives me 15, right? So this is an example. This is a very short and cute example of, of a first class function. I returned a function, I, I stored that function in a variable and then I called it, okay? What's the use case for this kind of a thing? Any ideas, any examples that come to your mind? How can I use, where can I use this kind of a feature? It looks kind of cute but doesn't seem very interesting. Sure. So, so he is saying that instead of x being a number here, it could be my database connection. Okay. And here, instead of this lambda just adding up these number, it could be a function which takes the SQL query and uses the DB connection and returns the result. Sure. That's a valid use case. So. To tell you the truth, this is a very general concept called a lexical closure, okay. C-L-O-S-U-R-E. So what's really happening here is when I'm returning this lambda, it's, it's an object, right? It's holding on to this X inside forever. It's, it's, it just captured that uh, value in that environment and is stored. And it will be used in subsequent calls to the lambda. Interesting here. Now, what if I do not have immutability? Things will be really screwed up. Okay. Imagine x being not a number, being a list. Okay. <laughs> and I'm closing over that list, and I'm going happy. Okay, fine. I've closed over it. I can use it whenever. But someone else changes changes it from somewhere else, it's basically pulling the rug from underneath my feet, right? I have no clue and I try using it later and it gives me some sort of exception or some error or it silently just gives me wrong data, right? So again, these concepts, these are possible in many languages like JavaScript has first class function, Python has first class function, Python doesn't have immutable data structure, okay? So if you use it like this, it's risky. So any Python programmer will probably copy it first. If it's a list, we will copy it first before using it. Very risky. Okay. So that's an example of returning a function from another function and bring it in a variable. Now look at the last line. It's a very cryptic line. Try to understand what's really going on. Okay. So I have this array of three uh, strings, Turing, Church, and Girdle. And then I'm calling the sort method on that array. But then I'm passing it some weird uh, looking thing. I'm saying key is equal to lower. So this is Python specific syntax, okay? Uh, here basically just you can just ignore this also. So I'm passing this lower thing to the sort method. What is lower? What's really happening? Well, uh, so my main objective with this sort function is that I have this array of strings, but before I sort it, I want to lowercase all the strings first. Okay? I want to lowercase all of them, and then I'll sort. Because sometimes, I, if it's case sensitive, then I can get in, incorrect answers. So I just want to lower them. Okay? So see what I really did here. So I passed the lower function to the sort function. I said, dude, take this function, and run this function on every item, first and then you sort this, okay? So this is a very also a, actually a interesting design pattern uh, and it can be accomplished without first class functions. Any idea what is it called in Java? What this pattern is called in Java? Yeah. Called dependency injection. Okay, so 
this is what I just did here. I injected a dependency so that lower function can be thought of a dependency of the sort function, right? So I injected it. So how do you do it in Java? You don't have cross-cross functions. So then you use interfaces, right? You take, let's say, a runnable. So what what's a runnable? A runnable is an interface which has only one method called run, right? So as long as I'm implementing that uh, method, it's fine. I can pass it any object. But think about the craft around it, right? I have to define an anonymous class if if I'm defining it, or maybe a named class, even worse. And then I have to implement that interface. And then tomorrow, let's say I I have some random method which belongs to a class which doesn't inter implement this interface. What do I have to do? I have to build a wrapper class around it, which uh, implements that runnable interface and calls the same method. Right? So it it's adds a lot of boilerplate around it. Here I'm just passing a function. Right? Just take it and run the function. This function is my interface. You can think of the function itself as being something which uh, conforms to a certain interface. Okay. So is this example clear? Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's a, a valid approach, but it's not viable because you'll be traversing the list twice. Yeah, I don't want that. So the result of this function called the output will not be lower case. The output will be in the up case. But while sorting, while I'm doing the comparison, I want it to lower case, right? But even if I, you know, you know, discount that requirement, I'll end up traversing the list twice unless I have lazy evaluation. Yeah, Python doesn't have it. But yeah, it's a, it's a valid approach. Uh, not probably always viable, right? But because sometimes you do, you are not. Uh, processing just lists. Sometimes you do actually want to send some uh, functionality over to some other function. Right? Any questions so far? Okay, great. Sequence transformation. So again, this is a simple example. Uh, what I really want to do here, don't, don't look at the uh, solution here. Okay. So I have this array called nums. It has some numbers in it, some negative numbers also. So I want to square all of them, okay, first. And then I only want to select the, the items which are greater than 1,000. Very simple use case. So in, in an imperative language, how will you start, right? Of course, you will have a loop. Maybe you will have two loops, right? In the first loop, you will uh, upcase everything and store it in another variable. And in second loop, probably you will have a have a another variable with the empty uh, array, and if it's more than thousand, then you will store it there, right? That's typical use case. Nothing wrong. We just wanted to show you a different approach towards solving the same problem, right? So in our traditional approach, we have variables that we keep on changing, right? Again, the von Neumann model. Uh, but this is the functional approach. See what's happening, okay? So the sec first line, I'm saying that nums is equal to all these numbers. That is. And then we have nums2. I cannot reset nums. It's not. Uh, it's allowed in Python, but it's not allowed in a pure language, pure functional language. So again, so what I'm saying is that num2 is map, and then something funky. There is some funky function called map, and then I'm giving it something called square, and then nums. What's really happening? Well, uh, this is called the map function. Okay, this is an abstraction, very common abstraction in functional languages. This abstraction is used for traversing lists or traversing any kind of sequential kind of data structure. So my use case is this: I want to traverse to a sequential data structure, and on every item of that list or sequence, I want to run some function and get back another list which has the same length as the original list but all the values are transformed by that function. That's what I'm doing here. So I have a built-in function I'm assuming called square which takes one number 
and returns the square of that number. Okay. So now I am doing a map operation. I am saying a map square on nums. So now it will give me a new list where every item is squared. I did that. Great. Now I want to only keep those which are greater than 1000. How do I do that? So again there is a very common kind of abstraction or a function called a filter function. So the filter function also takes a function as the first argument and then the sequence. Okay. Now you will see that I have given it a, a, a function, right? a lambda which checks if the number is greater than 1000. So in this case, so your idea won't work in this specific case, right? Because I want to filter. So in case of filter, I have to provide it a function. I cannot apply that function somehow outside and then chain filter on top of it and hope it to work. It will not work because it's not designed like that, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm calling filter. First argument to filter is a new function, which basically a, a a boolean function, it's a predicate. Okay. We call it a predicate in a functional language terminology. A predicate is just a boolean function which returns false. So the filter function will traverse through that list and it will run that predicate on every item. And if the predicate function returns true for that value, it will keep it, otherwise it will reject it. Right. So this is what's happening. So there was one number, I think, four and one forty-four. They were, they got filtered out, right? So again, very common uh, practice. So you can solve solve a whole class of uh, problems by using these kind of functions. Okay. So as a minor aside, functional languages, you will see that they have many, many, many functions. Okay. <laughs> so most functional languages probably have hundreds of functions. Hundred, but they all operate on a few types of data structures or classes. Okay. That's the main difference between uh, predominantly object-oriented languages and functional languages. In object-oriented languages, you have a lot of names. So names means classes. You have many classes, you have many names, and all the names encapsulate the verbs inside the name, like the methods. The methods are contained inside the class, right? So you have many names, few verbs. In functional language, it's just the opposite. You have just a few names. So you have a list, you have maybe a string, you have uh, a number, a few other kind of collection types, and then you have hundreds of of functions or verbs which run on these. Uh, data structure, right? So filter and map, they will work on anything that looks or works like a sequence, as an example, right? So you don't need uh, new classes to have different uh, methods in them. So the methods kind of like are laid flat in the namespace, and you give it, give you can give them different kinds of data structures. So yeah, so what I was uh, saying is that in FP languages, the focus is all on solving problems like this by transforming sequences by applying functions on top of functions and getting the end result without modifying stuff anywhere explicitly at least okay probably i had another example right there <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah so think about the, i was giving this example right so square of 5 is 25 i know that for sure so let's say in, in my code, somewhere I have this kind of like a call. I'm calling square five times or three times with five. The compiler can actually optimize it away and remove the function calls and place just the values right there. Okay. So interestingly, today I'll be honest, functional uh, code is slightly slower than imperative code. There are many reasons behind that. Hardware, uh, compiler technology, you know, uh, the amount of work or research that is being put into the solutions. But things are improving very fast, OK? So in, at least in theory, a compiler for a pure language can make these kind of optimizations. And there are some languages like Haskell where these kind of optimizations are always made. Haskell is a pure language. 
and and they are very crazy about all these kind of awesome optimizations, right? And then, yeah, and and then you there are functional languages where which are statically typed, but you don't have to mention the types everywhere. The types can be inferred uh, by the compiler itself, and the compiler can tell you exactly where the bug is. And these things are possible again because of certain guarantees like immutability, referential transparency, etc. Yeah, square is referentially transparent, right? So I can just replace any call to square with the value that it has returned once. Yeah, but why? I mean, okay, it looks very cool. Maybe it's different. Why should I use it? What's the point? Are you trying to sell me some snake oil? <laughs> Definitely not. There are many, many benefits. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I hope to touch on some of these. I probably won't be able to go into detail, but uh, these are some of the bullet points. So, higher levels of abstraction. Okay. Right now, let's say like, I'll pick on Java today. Java's bad luck, but uh, I'll give you some examples which are built on top of Java. But it applies equally to many other languages. So in Java, how, what kind of abstractions can I build? I mean, what, what what do I have? I have the class, fine, which lets me encapsulate some state and some behavior, fine. Uh, but what about, you know, and then how do I share uh, behavior through inheritance and maybe through dependency injection? But are there higher levels of abstraction that I can build? Can I have things like uh, like uh, like macros, let's say. Okay, so a macro lets you write code, which will generate some more code during compile time. It's possible in Java, but uh, you have to go into the you know bytecode assembler kind of ASM library and all these kind of things, very low level stuff. And the abstractions also that you build ultimately you are stuck with just the class and maybe the object. Right? That's all you've got. You can't build things like multi-methods, or you can't build things like protocols, or, or uh, even macros. I gave give an example because you know it's it's so low level that it doesn't let you speak in that language. Right? I, one example that I always give is uh, talking to a child about some deeply philosophical subject. How would you do that? A child probably has a vocabulary of few hundred or few thousand words. A child won't understand all these complicated concepts uh, that philosophy deals with, right? So if I have to talk to a child about these things, then I have to dumb down the philosophical uh, topics to such a level that uh, the child will understand, it, right? But by that time I have done it, I am very far away from the original concept that I wanted to express in the first place, right? And it happens with many languages all the time. So I have a business domain problem, but then by the time I have somehow uh, fitted it into the abstraction that the language provides, you know, it's a mess. Thousands of lines of code. I don't understand what I was supposed to accomplish in the first place. I have this huge dependency call graph of, of methods and, and classes and there is this relationship. It sucks, right? And even then, think about simple things like composability. If I want to compose classes together, yeah, sure, I have inheritance, but very quickly, I will need multiple inheritance. And multiple inheritance is a trap. It's a bear trap. Because it will give rise to this diamond problem, which is classic. You can't basically just solve. Okay? So you, you know why you have one class which is two base classes and both the base classes have same ancestor. And then what happens when you call the superclass class method from the lowest uh, derived class? Derived class. Uh, you can't guarantee what's going to happen there, okay? And then that's why Java also disallows multiple inheritance, but it allows you to use multiple interfaces, which honestly doesn't give you much, okay? So ideally, what I would like to do is build abstractions in such a way that my domain is modeled very closely in my solution. So if I look at my code, I'll immediately under be able to understand, okay, that's what is happening, right? My core or core logic 
will not be embedded 10 files down and 20 methods deep. Look at any Ruby on Rails project. Okay, where is the code? I mean, I keep looking at uh, any ROR project. I can't find the meat of the code. It's all scattered everywhere, right? With hundreds and thousands of boilerplate uh, lines of code. So Ruby, by the way, is a much better language than Java in the sense that it does allow you to build higher levels of abstraction. But yeah, whatever. I had to pick an example here. Uh, so I, I was also talking about modularity, right? We always take pride in being OOP programmers. So OOP is all about code sharing and modularity. Come on, are we really kidding ourselves here? How much code do we really share today? <laughs> I mean, so much code is copied across uh, names, packages that it's crazy, and you have to copy them. I can give you many examples where you know OOP, traditional OOP cannot just solve these problems. Uh, other benefits like lazy evaluation. Okay, to give you an example, what is the use case of lazy evaluation? Many use cases. Imagine this: uh, you have some code which processes some big data structure, and in some cases you do not use it. You do not need it. Okay. So if you have lazy evaluation, those parts will not be computed at all. Whatever you need, only those parts of the code will be executed. It also gives you another advantage. You can operate on infinite sequence. So I can give you many examples where I have, let's say, I want to find the first five odd numbers. Okay? How do I do that? I mean, there are many ways. Like if I start with the C language, first five odd numbers. So I'll have to put a limit somewhere, right? I'll say max is equal to thousand, and then I'll create a list of all the numbers and from there I will select the first five odd numbers and return the value. I have to have that max. But what if tomorrow, you know, I need more than that? I have to go and change the code, right? Lazy evaluation lets you hold on to and operate on infinite sequences without blowing up the computer. Okay? To give you an example very quickly here. Visible, right? Yeah. So this is a weird ass language which I use. It's called closure. This is not an introduction to this language, okay? But bear with me. I'll try to explain what I'm doing here. So what I just did here is that I'm holding on to all the numbers in the whole world, all the natural numbers, okay? Right now, ask for any number. I'll give you that number from that n. That n, I just defined an n, okay? So this is some code here. So what it does, I'll explain what it does. Okay. So this function iterate takes an initial value, which is the second argument, and a function, which is the first argument, and it returns an infinite sequence, which has the initial value as the first argument, first value, first item, and second item is this function applied to that initial value. And the third is this function applied twice, so on and so forth. Okay, so that basically gives me right now I'm iterating starting from zero with ink. Ink is increment. Okay, so n right now is a list which has zero and then ink of zero which is one and then ink of ink of zero which is two, so on and so forth, and all the numbers right now in here. To give you an example here, let me show you the ten thousandth number. Okay. It's easy, we know what the 10,000th number is, but I'll show it to you anyway. So I'll drop 999 from n. I'm telling my language here to drop the first 999 item from n. And take the first from whatever is remaining. OK, easy. I just got it. So I can also say. Uh, you know, show me the first five odd numbers, or maybe the maybe the fifteenth to twentieth odd number. Okay. So I'll filter all the odd numbers. I'll drop the first fifteen, and I'll take five from it. So this is <laughs> okay. So I can also you know drop more numbers, something like. 
15,000. Okay, show me the what is the in last of infinity? Have you seen the end of infinity? The mechanism to do that would be probably. No, I think uh, the mechanism to realize infinity would be to go to the Himalayas and sit there for 20 years, maybe. There is no limit. This number has no limit. It's actually infinity. Yeah. So th that limit probably right now is the CPU RAM that I have on my computer. That's probably the only physical limit. Logically, there is no limit right now. Logically. Okay. So that's what I'm concerned about. I cannot keep thinking about the computer all the time, the hardware all the time, because then my thinking will be restricted to CPU instructions. I want to be re removed from that because my business logic is not related to the computer architecture, architecture of the CPU, right? Business logic is about manipulating numbers, manipulating strings, right? Passing data from here and there. I don't care about how uh, how many bits of instruction the CPU can handle and all that. I don't care about that. Okay, moving on. So that's lazy evaluation. Concurrency and parallelism. They are closely related, but they are actually very different things. Can anyone tell me the difference between concurrency and parallelism? Hmm. Okay. No, that, that's the wrong answer. Uh, wrong. <laughs> it's actually much simpler than concurrency is about sharing resources between processes. Okay, so you have let's say one bank account. And 20 different processes are talking to that bank account. That's concurrent access of that bank account. Okay, and parallelism is actually doing different things at the same time. Now, parallelism and concurrency both can be emulated on a single core, right? I mean, you do do it through interleaving of instructions. True parallelism can only be achieved in a multi-core computer. But true concurrency, I mean, yeah, it can be achieved, uh, you know, through interleaving can be achieved everywhere. So, so then what are the challenges with concurrency? Okay, so we are talking about shared memory access, big problem. So yeah, I have a variable and multiple threads or multiple processes can modify and access it at the same time, right? Not at the same time, so since they are interleaved, so five instructions will be run maybe from this process and then five more from that process, so on and so forth, right? Like this, you keep on jumping. So if if my data structures are mutable, I have a huge problem there. So I have to lock, right? So before, before accessing it, I have to lock. And then uh, after I have uh, I'm done, I'm done with my work, I'll release the lock. What are the problems with locking? Huh? Yeah, sure, so deadlock can happen. What's a deadlock? So this guy is, is uh, waiting for that resource and this guy is also waiting for it and they are all waiting for forever. They never get it because someone forgot to release the lock or whatever, right? That can happen. Error handling, right? What if you held a lock and there is an exception? What now? The lock will be held forever. Problem. Locking order. Right? If you have five different things and you want to lock them, you have to lock them in a specific order and unlock them again in a very specific order. What if I get it wrong? It's totally possible for even a you know, very good programmer to get such kind of code wrong. So how do I solve this problem? Easy. Make your data structures immutable. If they are immutable, there is no mutation. And then uh, you, know, you don't want, need to worry much about you know, locking and all this. But sometimes 
to be honest, you do need mutation. You cannot eschew mutation completely. Because if your code is not uh, changing anything, then, then just the CPU is just getting hot and nothing is happening really. Right? There is no output. Because the output that we need or ask for from a computer is side effect. Right? Whatever, whenever I say print something, it is a side effect. It's writing to that device, the console device. That's side effect. But still, if you have a FP language where things are immutable, it's way easier to control access to those parts in a controlled way and uh, provide semantics which will guarantee safety. Parallelism. So again, uh, if you use, uh, a, if you write code in a functional way, you will see that there are many parts of the code which can be easily parallelized. So, for example, if I am uh, processing a list, if I am, uh, so give you this example, uh, yeah, this map, right? So I map square on nums. So what am I doing really? I am running the function square on each and every item. I don't have to do it sequentially. There is no guarantee. It doesn't say that I have to do it in a sequence, right? Because there, uh, there is no side effects. So I don't care. So I could very easily parallelize this code. And you know, run the square function on four different cores and hand, hand it four different slices of the same data structure, and it would be running in a parallel. Right? So, functional code basically lends itself to automatic parallelization by the compiler. The compiler can do it automatically for you. In a language where things are mutable, it cannot, because then the sequence, the order in which you process a list, is kind of like implicit assumption. Right, that I will always process it like this. Because if I process that part earlier, it can do something else, right? It can fire off a missile. I don't even know. Memoization is an example that falls off from referential transparency. Basically means that caching. So if I know that the square function takes uh, 5 and returns 25, that value can be cached forever for, the eter for eternity because that thing will never change because that function is referentially transparent. So that also means that uh, in a pure language, the runtime can cache all these values. It will never call those methods again, functions again. Testability, very interesting. I mean, you might think that how is testability even related? Well, if your code doesn't have much mutation or mutation is isolated in certain parts, the other parts which do not have any mutation are so easier so much easier to test, right? And even, I'll go a step even further. Uh, in FP languages, you can generate test cases from specifications. You don't even have to write test cases yourself. So there is something called quick check, which I would recommend that all of you guys check out. Uh, it's a tool for uh, Erlang and Haskell mainly, but there are many implementations for different languages. I, I think there is a quick check implementation for Ruby also. Check it out. See how it works. Uh, the way it works is that uh, you basically specify the behavior of your code in some way using the specification language. And you just tell it for how long you should run the test suite or how many test cases should be generated. And the system automatically generates all the test cases and finds and will find bugs. So there are many examples online which you, I would encourage you guys to check out. You'll see how QuickCheck is able to find bugs in your code which you never thought that they exist. And composability, again it falls off from that inheritance example that I was giving. When you can close over functions, close over values, return functions, take functions, it allows you to build highly composable kind of abstractions. So it's basically something like composition over inheritance, right? A lot of OOP guys I'm sure are familiar with this idea that has a relationship are always preferred over is a relationship. I won't go into much detail today about this, but functional programming languages implement has a kind of relationship. Okay? They don't care much about is a type relationships, and that gives you way more flexibility about around reusing code. Okay, so some FP languages that you should try out. Okay, these are kind of like hardcore FP languages. Okay, so I have Haskell, I have Clojure, Erlang, 
uh, ML racket. There are a bunch of others that you sh should learn or try out one day. But today, you can do some FP in these languages as well. Java is not included <laughs> because you know it's possible, but your coworkers will hate you. Okay? Because if you make everything final and everything public, you will be hated in your company. So maybe you use Scala for now. Scala is kind of like a good, decent enough bridge language. Uh, I mean, I don't really like it much, but you know. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get it out. But yeah, you can do that. Ruby is decent. JavaScript is decent. There are many libraries. Golang is kind of like the uh, odd man out here. But Go, even though it's not a functional language, has some very interesting concepts which come from FP, come from the FP world. And you should check it out, even if you do not care much about functional programming. Yeah. So I wanted to go into detail, but I don't think I have much time today. Uh, so very interesting ideas that work very well with the functional program, okay? And you will only be exposed to those ideas if you deal with it. If you are dealing with some other imperative language, you will never be exposed to these kind of ideas, like communicating sequential processes. Uh, it's a hard topic to explain in in a few minutes, but it is the you know it's it's basically a way of building software where processes kind of talk to each other through a communication medium. That could be a channel, or uh, in, in Go it's called a channel, in uh, Erlang it's called a process. But it lets you solve some seriously hard problem in very elegant and predictable uh, ways. Okay, should definitely check it out. And then generative testing is what I was talking about as quick check. Okay, quick check is an example of generative slash specification based testing. It lets you uh, provide the specification. And test cases are generated, right? So you know, if you are writing test cases today, think about stopping uh, that practice, okay? And you know, think about generating them instead because that's way more scalable. Logic and relational programming. I'll probably give you a small example. Uh, so again, some a very interesting branch of functional slash declarative programming, which lets you solve a class of problems without, you know. By just declaring, by just saying what the problem is, and solution just comes out of it. Okay, <laughs> it's very magical, but you should try it out. If you're writing parsers, functional languages will help you a lot. Functional languages have some concepts which are which uh, are very uh, useful for generating parsers and writing parsers, parser combinators. Okay, so so yeah, you should definitely check out these uh, libraries. So to give you an example here. Uh, yeah, is anyone aware of uh, the the zebra problem? It's a, it's also called Einstein's puzzle. It's basically a puzzle where uh, you know it's, it says that there is this Nor Norwegian guy. And he has a neighbor. That neighbor has a dog, and uh, you know then there is another neighbor who smokes the pipe, so on and so forth. And then there is this question that who owns the horse? Something like that, right? So you are asked to solve these kind of puzzles uh, or even business problems by the way in a, any other language oof, I won't even attempt that but this is the same problem solved in a logic programming language so now see what's really happening okay so first oh, so the first guy is Norwegian Nor the guy next to Norwegian has a blue something and the guy who is right of this ivory has this green thing right so on and so forth. So I'm just basically describing the puzzle itself, and the solution just comes out of it. Okay, so it is to me it is very magical. But the way it works, it it is basically a a, a search problem. It searches through the uh, the whole search space and finds the solution for you in a very efficient way. Okay, it, it, this code will run in my milliseconds, microseconds. In fact. Another example, so I just not sure if it's a good example, but I just wanted to give you an example of channels. Uh, so see, this code looks kind of like C, so probably you'll understand it better. So there is this thing called a channel. You can think of a channel as a pipe or a conduit, okay? Some communication medium. You use this this operator. 
the inward arrow operator to send something to that channel. Okay, that's the basic thing. So, what's this function doing here? This function is called generate, and it takes a channel. Okay, and this is the signature of the channel. It just basically means that it's a channel of integers. That's all. So it's okay. You can ignore that part. And then here, what it does is that says for i from two pi plus plus infinity, keep putting that i into that channel. So again, see that I'm kind of dealing with infinite stuff here using channels, but it's not the same thing. It's slightly different, but that can help you in accomplish the same kind of goals. Okay. So generate basically returns a channel, and it just keeps on putting in numbers starting from two to infinity to into that channel. And then I have a channel called filter, which takes two channels. One is called in, another is called out, and then you have an integer again, which is called prime. Okay, and it just checks this. It takes an item from that channel. If it's a you know a prime, if it's not divisible by that number, it puts it into that out channel. It's like a filter, right? It's, it's very similar to a filter function. That I showed you guys takes a channel and a number, takes two channels and a number, takes one item from the input channel, checks if the number is divisible by that number. If it's not, it's a prime. It's put put into the output channel. Okay. And then here, <laughs> this is the magic happens here. So, uh, yeah. Nothing. It's a it's a while here, right? This one, right? Yeah. It's a while <laughs> because I'm dealing with the infinite uh, channel, right? So I cannot stop. It's basically a while. And here, this is the main function. This is the main entry point. Here, I create a channel, the new channel, and then I say go generate ch. So I give this channel ch to the generate function, and the go. This this thing is interesting. When I say go. It, uh, I mean, in short, it it runs that thing in a new thread. Okay, you can think of it like that. So, this basically immediately this line is demonized, so it goes into that a new thread. Okay, and execution continues here. And there, here, I say for i from zero to ten, I take one prime number from this channel, and I print it, and then I make another channel and pass it to filter with a go. And I just reset the channel here, and it goes ahead. What's really happening here is an implementation of the sieve of Eratosthenes algorithm. Not sure if you guys are aware of it, but it's a it's called a prime sieve algorithm. It's like a sieve, like chhani, right? It will sieve out the primes out of this whole uh, space of all numbers. The way it works is by daisy chaining. Just so basically, one channel filters out multiples of one number. And then you daisy chain that with another channel, which uh, filters out another uh, number multiples, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, you get a prime number. So anyway, there's some example. Uh, I wrote it in closure, so this is the closure implementation. But yeah, we don't have time for this. So yeah, I'm done actually. Does anyone have any question? See, you can ask me. Feel free to ask me any question. Okay. Most of the uh, FP languages they have immutables, right? And uh, yeah, the pure ones at least. Yeah, pure yeah. ones. So, like, if I have immutables and like, as you said, like I have a list of mil uh, million records, but I need to change them, uh -huh. create. Excellent question. I understand your question. Uh, yeah. So uh, am I going to copy? That's your question, yeah, right? Yeah. Then I have to, again. I have two list of. Yeah. One you, of you are not going to copy. Uh, so very good question. Uh, so his question is this: If I cannot really change things, that means when I try to change them, a new version is created. So does that mean I am copying that whole thing again? Answer is no. Uh, to give you an example, let's say I have a list of million items in it, and I add something. In an imperative language, that new thing will actually get added to the old list, right? So nothing, no copying is involved. But if you think about a functional language in a naive way, 
then yeah, you will think that okay, how do I implement immutable stuff? Then I have to copy probably. Answer is no, because there are very novel data structures which allow you to avoid copying completely. What happens really is that that array of numbers is actually represented as a tree kind of data structure, like a tree data structure. And when you add something in a functional way, nothing is changed in the original tree. But a new root to that tree is created. So if you follow that new root, you will see the new value. And the old values, all the million old values are all shared in the new value that is generated. Again, that is possible because that tree is immutable. Because I can do that kind of structural sharing because the data structures themselves are immutable. Because if they were mutable, I couldn't have shared structure with them because someone else could have changed it and I cannot uh, share, right? So that's the basic, very important thing. Immutability actually allows you to share data structures. Mutability does not allow you. So mutability will actually make you copy stuff more than uh, a functional language. Can you please give examples of, uh, you know, any famous applications that have been developed using functional programming <laughs> recently? I mean, there are many. I mean, famous applications. I mean, it depends what kind of application. AutoCAD is written in Lisp. I don't know whether you guys know that, right? But that's a very old and contrived example. Uh, to be really honest, there are Clojure is right now running behind many many companies. We don't even know know that. Closure is being used. For example, Akamai uses Closure, Apple uses Closure, uh, McKinsey uses Closure. There are many other companies, like big companies, which are using Closure for various purposes, and we don't know because you know, I mean, those guys don't care about evangelizing and all that, right? Because their problems are real; they want to solve hard problems. So, NASA also used Lisp at some point. So, a lot of people have used it or are using it. Uh, but yeah, to be honest, it's not as much as uh, you know Java or mainstream languages. It's still kind of like in the used in the fringes. But if you look at the social media or whatever Google kind of trends, you will see that it's picking up very fast. So there are many languages like Scala, which lets you do some really good functional programming, but allows you to program in an imperative style as well. So you know, you know, there is more attraction towards those kind of languages because the transition is kind of easier. But I would, I mean, yeah, I have some opinion about that, but some other time. <laughs> so yeah, to be honest, uh, it, functional languages are used inside Google as well. Okay, even inside Facebook, they are used, but we don't know about that. Yeah, through Scala, and and Clojure. So Twitter uses a lot of Clojure, by the way. So they use, they, I don't know whether you have heard about something called Storm. It's a stream processing. Uh, real-time MapReduce kind of thing is written in Clojure. Uh, I have two questions basically. Uh, you mentioned that Clojure is somewhat uh, slow because of some reasons, and then again you mentioned that uh, compiler of Clojure handles the parallelism automatically. Right. So it's kind of contradictory, is it? No. Okay. So there is there is speed up to be had from just this one CPU versus speed up that I can gain from parallelizing my code, right? So let's say I'm just uh, adding numbers. So in that case, closure will be slower than Java, right? But potentially, if I want to run thousands and thousands of, uh, let's say, processes slash threads in a way which is clean and uh, lock-free and predictable and, and correct, you can't do that in Java easily. You have to write so many lines of code and get it reviewed by many people, and even then you can't guarantee that it's correct. But in closure, it will be very little, like this example, right? Like the, the, the chain example that I gave you. Here, actually, multiple threads are running. But you are not launching the threads manually and, manu and, and handling them and managing them manually, right? You just use the Go keyword. That's what spawns it. And, and the runtime will take care of scaling it over all the cores that you have available. So it's like a higher level of abstraction. Right? You don't manipulate threads and variables and all these things. Uh, by hand. And what is closure script? Yeah. So to, to give you an example, to give give you some uh, background about closure, closure is a programming language which runs on the JVM. It is a dialect of Lisp. It is a mostly functional language. Uh, it's not as pure as Haskell, but things are all immutable in closure. Okay. So 
so it's not out there like Haskell, but it's more functional than many other functional languages. It runs on the JVM. Closure script is a compiler for Closure, which generates JavaScript code. So it lets you write Closure code, which runs in the browser. The same semantics, uh, Closure semantics, Closure's purity, Closure's immutable data structures, all in your browser, and it's very fast. I want to pick on the last thing that you talked about, that is, uh, you know, don't write tests, generate them. Uh, I want to understand what is the context in which mm. you're just saying that. Because when you write tests, all right, so when we say test cases, uh, we mean a lot of things. That's, that's what I want to clear. So some kind of test cases might uh, be the specification for the business logic itself, right? That when I do this, that should be the result. Fine. In those cases, you have to write them yourself, maybe, because it's some uh, really specific business logic, and you just care about that specific kind of like test case. But there are, there are other cases, right? For example, uh, I'm writing a function which uh, sorts a list. Simple, right? How do you test it? Right? How many list examples can you come up with which you think will sufficiently test all the edge cases? of the algorithm. You can't, right? In those cases, it's best to just uh, specify what you want. You What what you really want, the input is a, a list of integers or numbers, which can be zero also. I mean, it can be an empty list also. And the output will also be a list of integers. Constraint is that it will have the same length as the original one, and they will all be in order. That's your specification. And now, now you can ask the run the, the, the test uh, engine to generate as many tests as you want. Right? So that's where I think it really helps. Like there are many other examples. I don't really have much time to go into details. But when you're testing concurrent code, right? How do you test concurrent code today? It's not possible. You are not even testing your concurrent code today. <laughs> many majority people don't test it because how do how would you create a harness? for a concurrent uh, kind of like scenario without mocking things. That's what we do, right? Ultimately, we end up mocking stuff. If you are mocking everything away, then you are not really testing behavior, probably testing the API at best. You are not really testing the implementation, right? So in those cases, I think it really helps if you can use generative testing uh, because it provides you the scaffolding and the kind of the framework which lets you uh, just specify the tests and will take care of the rest. I hope that answer. But to be really honest, uh, there is no silver bullet. Doesn't matter what you are talking about, right? So you need a mix and match of all kinds of stuff. But in some cases, simple testing really helps. Uh, but majority of cases, generative testing should solve your problems better than writing test cases manually. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, one is kind of practical. Uh, is functional programming only suitable for uh, mathematical or uh, no, server side not. programming? Because I have seen like Haskell is coming out with Snap and Chicago. So we use Closure. So our 95% of our code base is in Closure. Okay. So we've been using it since 2009, and ultimately it's a web-based product with servers and REST APIs and talking to databases, talking to message queues, talking to caching servers, sending email, right? So it's a classic kind of SaaS product of today, written completely in closure. So the answer is no, You can. it's totally general purpose. Unless the programming language itself is not general purpose. For example, it could be something like Prolog. Prolog, even though you can solve many kinds of problems in Prolog, it's Strictly not general purpose, uh, not at least as general purpose as Haskell. Haskell is fully general purpose. But Haskell has other issues, like since it's an academic language, the focus is more on the science part of it than the practical aspects. So in some cases, Haskell may not be suitable. That's where I think Scala closure kind of fit into that kind of use case, where you want to solve business problems today uh, with uh, 
predictable speed with uh, sufficient uh, you know quality and uh, safety and all these things. Okay, second question is a little philosophical. Uh, is functional programming? I mean, when when since we are used to ob object oriented programming for so many years, functional programming seems strange. But is it in reality uh, like if I if I go and try to teach object oriented programming to a student uh -huh. like a, a school school students, then they find it difficult to think about mutability. So is it like Actually, uh, to be honest, programming is more natural. Yes, that's. It might sound counterintuitive. It's actually way easier to teach FP to a child than teach uh, traditional imperative programming language, because you know it's not natural for you to say x is equal to five and then x is equal to twenty. Right? When you do that, and and since it it is based on just transformation of things and not changing of places and variables, it's very common. Very easy to understand. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. Great question. So, what's your problem really? Are you really trying to un learn a functional programming, or are you trying to solve a real business problem? Okay. So, you have many choices there. Okay. Uh, I would obviously say closure is the most you know obvious choice today if you want to solve business problems and want to use uh, fun uh, functional programming. Because what are the challenges really? The biggest challenge that I've seen. With all these different languages, is the ecosystem. Okay, so I have this very nice language; doesn't have any libraries. Should I li write all these libraries? Because I have a simple problem. I just need OAuth, for example, or I want a, a email client, or I want to I want a HTTP client, or a simple HTTP server. Do I have to write it now? So that's why I think ecosystem matters a lot. Okay, uh, so you that language must have a good ecosystem. So that's why. I think that's where many languages will automatically be disqualified because they don't have a vibrant ecosystem. Haskell is kind of like in the middle. It does have a good ecosystem in certain cases, uh, and it's growing fast. But for example, if it's something like standard ML, standard ML does not have any ecosystem. I can't use it to solve any real problem today. Okay? If it's something like some old dialect of Scheme, again, doesn't have any ecosystem. So. So I think ecosystem matters, and then of course, ecosystem also means documentation. It also means uh, community, all these things, right? Uh, apart from that, I think if you are trying to solve a real problem, and if you don't have much time, I mean, time is also a constraint, right? Uh, or a, or a learning curve is also a constraint. If those things matter to you, then maybe take the least path of least resistance, and maybe choose Scala. You know, up to you, but it will provide you the path of least resistance. If you really want to do FP, you can do it in Scala today. But the problem is, Scala is not opinionated. Scala doesn't care if you you write code in a FP way or a Java way. It it is it will give you give it to you, right? So you don't get the same kind of guarantees that you might get from a Haskell or a Closure. But Scala is still, I think, a good choice because it has a great community. I mean, lot of traction, right? Good documentation, so on and so forth. Uh, otherwise, if you just want to learn FP, Scheme is the best choice. Okay, because it's uh, no frills, it's just the basic stuff, and it will really teach you the core concepts really well. And from there onwards, you can move to some other uh, language. Ah. Okay, uh, let's 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 try the ma'am here. Oh, my 
face is not visible because of this. <laughs> In the camera, you mean? Okay. Better? So it will give you a taste of it. Okay. So there is a library called functional Java, functional dot Java. It's a good library, but uh, it has many interesting all the functional concepts like map filter all implemented. But the problem is, Java the language is built on top of a certain set of abstractions, right? And if you try to really emulate a functional style on top of Java, as long as it's still Java, it will cause problems to you because you will face roadblocks. You will accomplish something, and then you have to share some code with a library code which doesn't use this library. You can't, right? Because then you will be in your own island where you are using the functional way, but you can't collaborate with others. Right? So that's where uh, that's why people end up writing languages. For example, Clojure and Scala are both written in Java. They both run on the JVM, but they are totally different languages because of the semantics that the languages export. Closure the language does not expose any way for you to mutate a variable, for example. But Java does, right? Even if I kind of like cover it up with abstractions and interfaces and all these things, ultimately the thing is the, the manhole is still there, right? The pit is still there. I can still fall into that uh, hole, right? That's why I said that if you write functional Java, people will hate you, right? Uh, because your coworkers will hate you. They won't be able to collaborate with you. Your intelligence will stop working. Right? Code completion will break. Lots of things will happen. Uh, and uh, then people will say, oh, "What are you doing? You are not doing correct OOP and all that." So it's it's also a social and cultural problem. Uh, if you try to do something completely different in one language, which is so opinionated about a specific style. Yeah, Java 8, yes, but it's still very lame, Lambda. <laughs> yeah, it is there now. I mean, after 60 years, yes. Yeah, six zero years. <laughs> Who had Java? No. How? And it was classes. That's not a Lambda. A Lambda, then I have to conform to an interface. How will I call that method inside? I don't even know which method to call. Yeah, but I get lexical scoping, but that's class-based scoping. Fine, scoping is not the only aspect of uh, lambdas. What about closures? Lexical closures? They were never there. I couldn't close over anything in, in Java, right? I could only close over things which is not even a closure. Basically, those are class at fields. I can close over those. That doesn't help much. Whoever. <laughs> I can't hear you. Is the mic on? Yes. 